Welcome to this short CPD video from the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists looking at how planning reform impacts the staged process of decision making in relation to archaeology. Uh, the video is about seven minutes long. Uh, you can count it on your CPD log and it includes further reading at the end to help you log more time on this topic. If you work in development-led archaeology, this will hopefully be a helpful primer for you on the recent policy context of the planning system in England. I'm going to quickly describe uh, the staged process for archaeological decision making and then look at the recent planning reforms that have threatened to impact that established process for doing archaeology and then generating public benefit from it. Um, then in the last minute I'll conclude with a short look at the outlook for further change um, and then I'll provide some additional resources for, for reading uh, and taking action. So this diagram shows the staged process for undertaking archaeology in the planning system. It starts with early discussions between the developer and the local planning authority to establish whether there are archaeological issues to consider on a given site. Um, it then follows a process of, where necessary, hiring an archaeological contractor who will undertake a desk-based assessment to collate existing information and make a preliminary assessment of significance and potential impact on a site. Um, and site evaluation if needed to give greater certainty about the presence or significance of assets and impacts on them. Using this information, development plans are designed or modified and a programme of archaeological investigation undertaken either before or during development. Um, and then that's agreed as part of the determination of the planning application, which can be granted subject to a planning condition that the WSI, the Reference Scheme of Investigation, will be followed. So this process um, secures analysis, publication, archiving and public engagement, creating new knowledge, um, delivering that to the public and to specialist audiences. And this is an established process by which archaeology ensures that we have the right information to make decisions and that we have the appropriate processes to influence the design of development so that um, you can avoid or mitigate harm to heritage assets or offset that harm with other benefits like engagement. So various planning reforms and proposals over the last few years have impacted the way that that system functions in relation to certain types of planning proposals and developments. I'm going to break these changes down into two types. Uh, reforms which can be broadly described as being kind of relaxations to planning regulations, although as we'll see, some are actually additional new forms of regulation which have a specific aim of making the system quicker or lighter touch by creating kind of workarounds. Um, and the second being reforms or budgetary changes affecting the resourcing of that system. There have been various uh, types of change in this category. The first is creeping permitted development rights, which have been adding um, almost year on year ever more types of development which do not require a planning permission. For example, if you are a homeowner, you are entitled in most circumstances to extend your home within certain boundaries without planning permission. This means that even sites in archaeologically sensitive areas like sites adjacent to say scheduled monuments or in historic city centres can't be required to undertake archaeological mitigation as you would usually have assured through a proper full planning application. Um, another example of permitted development rights would be the conversion of some types of ex-industrial building to residential uses. Um, with this type of development that there's potentially significant levels of ground disturbance on what might have previously been largely intact subsurface remains. Uh, a second example is permission in principle which is um, brought in under the 2016 Housing and Planning Act and this essentially provided an alternate consent route which sidesteps some planning controls for sites which are recorded in brownfield registers uh, by local authorities and um, with the possibility in law for this to apply to sites that are allocated in local plans too. Uh, so to use permission in principle, developers still have to take archaeology into account, but it's considered a matter of, uh, quote, 
technical details and crucially those technical details are assessed after permission has been granted. A third example is um, from the planning white paper in 2020 which has since been dropped um, but was proposed to uh, create a zonal system of growth areas around the country essentially which would have been areas where permissioning principle applied um, to all development and it's not wholly clear that that idea has been completely dropped by government yet. Um, a final category is the restriction of existing planning controls like Article 4 directions. Now Article 4 directions can be used to exempt certain areas from permitted development rights where there are local reasons to do that. Now that's a locally controlled process brought in by local authorities that central government has been quite keen to crack down on in recent years. So these types of reform mostly have the effect of sidestepping that requirement to undertake early discussions about archaeology and do assessment and evaluation before planning permission is granted. And this means that developers may not have understood the archaeological risk and opportunities at that point where they're making those critical decisions about a project, including the point of submitting an application. And this reduces the likelihood that archaeology will capitalise on the benefits um, that can arise from doing archaeology, like influencing the design proposals to better reveal the significance of heritage assets. And it also increases the chance that heritage assets will be discovered later in the process, causing possible knock-on impacts if sites of national importance are discovered and subsequently need to be scheduled, or if the unexpected greater cost of archaeology ends up making that development project unviable. So the second issue is potentially more straightforward. This is about the persistent underfunding of the planning system, which is frequently cited as being one of the major causes for delays in planning. Um, moreover, this can be characterised as a ratcheting of pressure over the years on local planning authorities. Uh, so various disincentives have been placed on local planning authorities in the form of strict time limits for determination of application, financial penalties for you know, so-called poor performance um, and the threat of special measures, measures being applied to um, those local planning authorities. And these things all make it harder to deliver good sustainable decisions because it just puts extra pressure on those staff that are uh, required to deliver them under harsher conditions. Um, and overall, uh, cuts in the budget to local authorities has led to a decline in that capacity in key conservation and archaeological advisory roles. There was a 33% decline between 2016 and in the latter part of the 2010s, only now uh, recently starting to level out and, and maybe recover a little bit. And at worst, that has led to the closure or mothballing of historic environment records in um, a number of authorities over the last decade. As for the current situation and future outlook, there is plenty more reform likely to be happening in the next couple of years. So the Leveling Up and Regeneration Bill was published in May this year, 2022, and includes some very positive pro provisions like a proposal to make historic environment records statutory. And that's something that SEPA um, and other organisations have campaigned for for a long time. Um, and other changes uh, in the bill affecting things like local plans and um, how national and local policies go to work. I will be making a separate video on the levelling up and regeneration bill in the near future. Um, and linked to the levelling up and regeneration bill, there's going to be a national planning policy framework review probably in 2023. Um, and further planning reforms are likely via secondary legislation and possibly further primary legislation. Um, including the possibility of further zonal systems based around the ideas of streamlined consent. So, in conclusion, uh, this is a really fast-moving context where CIFA and our colleagues in other bodies um, have been developing evidence and arguments to defend the, the existing processes for doing archaeology and planning, um, as well as designing new potential routes to doing effective archaeology in response to um, new reforms and new proposals. Um, and this process of trying to build good relations to influence these future proposals for planning change is um, one that you can find more, in, more information about um, online. So 
Please see the links that are available in the description where you're watching this video and on the CEQA webpage if you'd like to find out more on this topic. Uh, there are also several other videos in this series exploring some of that evidence of the current system um, of where archaeology in planning works and why, um, along with a short PDF guide that you can use and share. If you are a CEFA member, make sure to keep your eyes on your inbox for regular advocacy updates and check out the CEFA website for a toolkit on how you can get involved. Uh, there's also a list of other really helpful publications from Historic England and Algeo which provide more information about archaeology and planning. Uh, thank you for watching and we'll see you again next time.